Emma Goldman was 20 years old when she moved to New York City for the first time. She knew all of the three people, and even that's a stretch. She knew her aunt and uncle, and as soon as she got off the train, she went unexpectedly to their apartment, knocked on their door, and dropped off her suitcase and sewing machine. And that's pretty much all she says about them. She also knew a guy named Soltaroff, but this is truly a bizarre story. I mean, she didn't really know the guy. As far as I can tell, all that happened is she went to hear one of his anarchist lectures when she was in New Haven and maybe said hi to him afterwards. She did have an address for him, but it was out of date. Right after she left her stuff with her aunt and uncle, she went and knocked on the door at the address she had, but all the new tenants could tell her was that he had moved somewhere on Montgomery Street, but they didn't know the street number. Then she did the next obvious thing and went to Montgomery Street and just started knocking on strangers' doors until she found them. When she did finally find him, he was actually delighted to see her. He took her inside of his apartment, gave her some snacks, told her all about the neighborhood, and then took her to dinner at a place called Sax's Cafe. Sax's wasn't really just a restaurant. It was the place in town where all the anarchists would go when they had some downtime to catch up with their friends and just see what was going on. Before she left for the night, Goldman had met two new roommates, and I think it's fair to say, the man who had become the most important person in her life for the rest of her life. Here's how she described it in her memoirs. For one who had just come away from the monotony of a provincial town like Rochester, and whose nerves were on edge from a night's trip in a stuffy car, the noise and turmoil that greeted us at Saxes were certainly not very soothing. The place consisted of two rooms and was packed. Everybody talked, gesticulated, and argued in Yiddish and Russian, each competing with the other. I was almost overcome in the strange human medley. My escort discovered two girls at a table. He introduced them as Anna and Helen Minkin. They were Russian Jewish working girls. Anna, the older, was about my own age. Helen was perhaps 18. Soon we came to an understanding about my living with them, and my anxiety and uncertainty were over. I had a roof over my head. I had found friends. The bedlam at Saxes no longer mattered. I began to breathe freer, to feel less of an alien. While the four of us were having our dinner, and Solterov was pointing out to me the different people in the cafe, I suddenly heard a powerful voice call. Extra large steak! Extra cup of coffee! My own capital was so small, and the need for economy so great, that I was startled by such apparent extravagance. Besides, Solterov had told me that only poor students, writers, and workers were the clients of Sachs. I wondered who that reckless person could be, and how he could afford such food. Who is that glutton? I asked. Solterov laughed aloud. That is Alexander Berkman. He can eat for three, but he rarely has enough money for much food. When he has, he eats sacks out of his own supplies. I'll introduce him to you. I'm Jeff Grossman, and this is Across from Jericho, an activist history podcast. This season, we're talking about the famous, or infamous, anarchists Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. In this episode, Goldman and Berkman first meet and have a tangled relationship with Johann Most, a man with a reputation for advocating violence. This story is pretty unfact-checkable, and common sense tells me that maybe it didn't all happen in exactly the same day. However, it's definitely true that she did meet all these people in a very short period of time after she arrived in New York. I was really curious about Sax's Cafe and this whole idea of kind of a drop-in anarchist meeting place. So I talked to Professor Tom Goyens, who teaches history at Salisbury University in Maryland. He's an expert in the history of anarchism in New York City. This is what he told me. Anyone who, who delves into this world, um, where else would they meet? Working people had no free time, really. Very little, which is, by the way, one of the key issues in, I would say, the entire history of the labor movement. 
I can't stress that enough. I mean, yes, wages are important, hours, the conditions. I think this whole idea of having free time is immensely important. He went on to say that, especially for anarchists, free time wasn't just a luxury, but really an essential feature of the entire political philosophy. I mean, there were singing societies, there were debating clubs, there were small lending libraries, often located inside saloons. They held picnics almost every week. They would all uh, go out and they, there would be directions of where to go to the parks in and around New York. They would organize children's games. It was a family affair. And they had this little movement that, and this is critical. A lot of people ask, so what, what's so special with the anarchists? Here is why, because the anarchists built this movement. They saw this movement as practicing anarchism in the here and now. And so it's what's called prefigurative politics. So I would argue that the picnics were not just outings. They were anarchism in practice. And I have in my first book, I quote some reports in the anarchist press where, where it's clear that they, they enjoyed an anarchist day out. So I think the way anarchists practice their activism including inside the beer halls, which often had discussion rooms at the, at the very end, the back rooms. Those little sessions were anarchism itself. So I think that is critical to understand. And I think it's still true. I mean, anarchism is alive and well today. They don't have parties or anything, but they have bookshops and they have co-ops and would not bombs and they have all kinds of discussion groups. And yes, now and then they go out in the street and protest. It's not really a surprise then that Goldman first met Berkman at a place like Sachs's. Even though he was only 18, he was a committed anarchist. Unlike Goldman, he had a bit of a radical history in his family. His uncle Maxim had been arrested for being an anti-Tsarist nihilist back in Russia. Like Goldman, he had spent some time as a child living in Kovno, Lithuania, but his family seems to have been wealthier in that he talks about having had a summer house in St. Petersburg. In his book, Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist, Berkman talks about being in that house when his mom was sick and seeing her slap one of the maids. He called her out on it, but she wasn't really interested in hearing it. And he was so enraged by that, he picked up a bowl of salt and threw it into a mirror, smashing the mirror. Later on that same night, they really still hadn't made up, but she was feeling especially sick and called him over. He sat and held her, and she died in his arms. It was only a few months after that that he moved to the United States. Decades later, Berkman wrote a book called Now and After, The ABC of Communist Anarchism. This excerpt will give you a pretty good idea of his lifelong philosophy. There is a deep-seated sense of justice in mankind. And your better nature always resents it when you see injustice done to anyone. You feel outraged and become indignant over it. Because we all have an instinctive sympathy with our fellow man. For by nature and habit, we are social beings. But when your interests or safety are involved, you act differently. You even feel differently. Suppose you see your brother do wrong to a stranger. You will call his attention to it. You will chide him for it. When you see your boss do an injustice to some fellow worker, you also resent it and you feel like protesting. But you will most probably refrain from expressing your sentiments because you might lose your job or get in bad with your boss. Your interests suppress the better urge of your nature. Your dependence upon the boss and his economic power over you influence your behavior. Suppose you see John beat and kick Bill when the latter is on the ground. Both may be strangers to you, but if you are not afraid of John, you'd tell him to stop kicking a fellow who is down. But when you see the policeman do the same thing to some citizen, you will think twice before interfering because he might beat you up too, and arrest you to boot. He has the authority. 
John, who has no authority, and who knows that someone might interfere when he is acting unjustly, will, as a rule, be careful what he is about. The policeman, who is vested with some authority, and who knows there is little chance of anyone interfering with him, will be more likely to act unjustly. Even in this simple instance, you can observe the effect of authority, its effect on the one who possesses it, and on those over whom it is exercised. Authority tends to make its possessor unjust and arbitrary. It also makes those subject to it acquiesce in wrong, subservient, and servile. Authority corrupts its holder and debases its victims. Even though Berkman wrote that as an adult, he was so obsessed with being an anarchist when he was a teenager that he bullied his friends about it, and to my mind, he seems to have been pretty insufferable. For example, not too long after they met, Berkman introduced Goldman to his closest friend, a guy named Modus Stein, who Goldman just called Fedya. Fedya was an artist, which was something that Berkman didn't approve of. He told Goldman that Fedya could never be a good anarchist because he accepted money from home, and that being an artist was no way to contribute to the revolution. It doesn't take Goldman long at all to become part of the circle. She's living with the Minkin sisters, hanging out with Berkman and with Fedya, and they're all kind of learning from each other. Their radicalism is bouncing around and developing as they grow. Kenyon Zimmer is a history professor at the University of Texas at Arlington, and he wrote a book called Immigrants Against the State, Yiddish and Italian Anarchism in America. Here's how he described the scene with Goldman, Berkman, and other newly arrived immigrants like them. They often arrived not in the romantic historical version we often hear about dreaming of streets of gold or American freedom. Mostly they arrived knowing that their main goal was to work for wages, which in the United States, although low compared to today's standards, were certainly higher than most opportunities available to them abroad, as well as, of course, in the Russian Empire, anti-Semitism was rife both officially and unofficially. But little prepared most of these immigrants for the reality of what urban, industrial, working class life was going to be like in the United States. And a lot of them arrived with some sort of radical political sympathies, often vaguely socialist in nature. From Russia, virtually none arrived as anarchists per se. There was no anarchist movement within the Russian Empire uh, until the early 20th century. So even though some of the most important and influential theorists of 19th century anarchism, like Mikhail Bakunin and, and Peter Kropotkin, were from Russia, they were not active within Russia and did not have a, a great following in Russia. So Goldman and Berkman were typical in that they both came to the United States arriving not yet as anarchists. So in other words, it was their experiences in the United States in part that turned them towards this particular brand of radicalism. Really at this point, Goldman, Berkman, and their friends were kids. They were figuring life out. They were figuring their beliefs out. They were having a good time. There's one figure in this group, though, that doesn't fit in this category at all. You might remember that I mentioned at the end of the last episode that Goldman showed up in New York carrying a newspaper in addition to her suitcase and her sewing machine. This newspaper was the Freiheit, published by Johann Most, who was sort of an anarchist celebrity. Unlike the others, he was German rather than Russian, and he had actually been a member of the German parliament before he moved to the United States. He was also in his early 40s, so he was more than twice Goldman and Berkman's age. But pretty much everyone who was interested in anarchism read the Freiheit. Here's Professor Goyens. Yeah, so when Goldman arrives, there is this anarchist movement mostly dominated by Germans. I, I would almost say German men. There is also that kind of gender aspect to it. And by far the most important periodical, I would say, of the entire German radical diaspora. Certainly, German anarchist transatlantic movement was Freiheit, which had been founded in London in 1879, and Moss just brought it over. And so, if you were a young person 
and you arrive in the United States in that turbulent period of the mid 1880s. There's the Haymarket Affair, which probably we'll get into a little bit. And you hear about anarchists, hear about these trials. There is a lecture circuit. You're going to learn about Most and Freiheit. Right after Goldman first met Berkman at Saxe's, he took her from there to a lecture that Most was giving. Not only that, the next day, he took her to the Freiheit office to meet him in person. Most liked Goldman so much that he told her to come back the next week and talk to him about getting a job there. Of course, Goldman jumped at the chance, but Most didn't represent the optimistic, humanist, sunny side of anarchism. He was deeply associated with the dark, violent side. He was the chief spokesman of anarchist violence. Last episode, we heard from Randall Law, a history professor at Birmingham Southern College who wrote a textbook on the history of terrorism. Here's what he told me about Most. Most is German. He's an anarchist who from early on is, he is in love with the idea of violence. And there's an ideological element to his emergence in the 1870s and 1880s. He's a committed anarchist. There's also probably a personal, a psychological element. Um, early in his life, he had some sort of pustule on his face, a cyst, and a, a surgeon tried to remove it and botched it. And he had this horrible scar. So he grew this big beard to cover it up. Um, so that most then becomes, uh, he becomes the image that when Europeans and particularly Americans close their eyes and imagine anarchist terrorist, it's the image of Johann, John, most, the bearded, wild-haired radical. He had anger issues, we might say, and was willing to use violence to awaken society. He writes a German newspaper, Freiheit, Freedom, which circulates in the German underground in the 1880s. And it's anarchist, but he becomes the great proponent of propaganda of the deed in Europe. He takes it up from other anarchists, from Bakunin early on when Kropotkin is talking about Kropotkin, Peter Kropotkin, um, is ambivalent about whether or not violence is legitimate in pursuing anarchism. He always flirted with that. Most had no such qualms. Most is absolutely dedicated to it. So he, he publishes this newspaper that has all sorts of specific prescriptions for using violence, stabbings, killing, shootings. He later uh, takes a job in a munitions factory so that he can learn how to make dynamite so that he can then publish the recipe and spread gospel of dynamite that dynamite is the great weapon of the oppressed. The term today is force multiplier that's widely used by the, the military and also discussion of irregular warfare. The idea of the force multiplier is that one person can use technology and tactics to magnify their, their impact, kill more people. But for those who would use terrorism, call more attention to their cause. And so most becomes one of these great proselytizers about dynamite in particular as a way to terrify the authorities and wake up the masses. One of the funny things was is that most had a hard time circulating his newspaper and there's a lot of evidence that state agents would actually infiltrate the anarchist movement, help circulate his newspaper, and in fact sometimes even contribute articles to it um, so that these newspapers would get into the hands of, in Germany, uh, the working class, so that the authorities can say, look how dangerous these ideas are, not so that they could crack down on the anarchists, but so that they could crack down on the socialists. But anyway, false flag operations. But most then starts touring the United States. He comes to the United States for the first time in mid-80s, 85, 86, I'm trying to remember exactly. And he is rapturously welcomed um, in the United States, you know, he gives talks to crowds of thousands of people, um, including in Chicago. And he becomes an important exporter of the idea of not just anarchism, but violent anarchism that uses terrorism and propaganda of the deed, again, to, to terrify the authorities and wake up the masses. And um, 
probably because this is the way in which a lot of these ideas are introduced to the United States, given the fact that the socialist movement and the trade union movement was was behind where Europe was, this further exacerbates middle class elite fear of foreigners, of immigrants, close association with all of these different, all these dangerous ideas, um, which ironically then, and this is a, a story worth pursuing, ironically really sets back the labor movement in the United States because it becomes so closely associated because of most and because of his descendants uh, and the Haymarket riot and so on and so forth. Um, the labor movement becomes so associated with anarchism and violence, it sets back the work that was actually probably beginning to bear fruit by various aspects of the American labor movement. That's a whole other story worth pursuing. That's a very important one. The way in which American anarchism becomes incredibly counterproductive in terms of what they imagined they were trying to achieve. This is the guy who became Berkman and Goldman's boss, mentor, and friend. But Professor Goyens, who's writing a biography of Most, said that in this point in his career, Most was actually pivoting away from that kind of violent talk. It's a great question to to have that sort of, you know, have these two timelines and then they come together because Most, uh, Goldman and Berkman are, you know, of a younger generation and they then meet this older, not old, but older person who is really in the middle of his own transition from advocating insurrectionary violence, if need be, right, to further the cause. Uh, he's in a transition from that towards being much more skeptical that that would be not just possible, uh, especially in the United States, but even ethically justified. Not only that, Goyen said, although most did promote an awful lot of violent talk, he himself never committed any acts of violence. To my knowledge, Johann Most never committed a violent crime. And maybe that's good to put that out there first. But I would say that Most bears some responsibility for the production of this long-standing stereotype of the bomb-throwing anarchists, even though he never threw a bomb. He was also beginning to tone down his speech for the very practical reason that he was worried about being arrested. Most solution, and many other anarchists, was, well, we equalize the playing field, and we just use weapons, we use self-defense, and this is right when you know dynamite was had been invented a few, I, I want to say maybe a decade or, or so earlier. And uh, I mean, I think a lot of this was for Moss just rhetoric. I mean, he he wanted to be um, hard hitting. I think there's a bit of theatrics involved. Moss was very fond of the stage. Not to do too much psycho history here, but I think he he knew how to work a crowd. He was an excellent speaker. So when Goldman and Berkman arrive in his sphere, I think Most had already serious doubts of that kind of propaganda by the deed, which was this term that goes back longer in Europe and which originally didn't just mean violence. Um, it could mean different deeds that could have an inspirational effect, not just bombs. But it sort of, the press got hold of it and it became basically terrorist violence. So Most was already doubting that this would have an, uh, and, and that, that this would have, a, have any effect, especially in the United States. And so, I think the moment Most meets Goldman and Bergman, he senses that these youngsters are in awe of him. And I think he likes that. But then they sort of go their own way and they do what they want and they, they talk about what they want. And so he gets more 
uh, uncomfortable with this. It's important to remember that Most had been arrested almost simultaneously to the Haymarket bombing. Now, he wasn't in Chicago. He had nothing really to do with it, except for some of his rhetoric that would appear in Chicago newspapers. Uh, but there is a sense that Most was very scared because the Chicago authorities wanted to extradite him to Chicago from New York. I think Haymarket enraged him, but it made him also cautious. That's where Most was at when Goldman first met him and went to work for him. But their relationship got really personal really quickly. The evening after her first day at his office, he took her to dinner and bought her a bunch of wine and told her all about what she should read to continue her anarchist education. Goldman told Berkman all about it, which set up an ongoing pattern of jealousy between Berkman and Most. The next day, when Berkman called, I related to him my wonderful evening with Most. His face darkened. Most has no right to squander money to go to expensive restaurants, drink expensive wines. He said gravely. He is spending the money contributed for the movement. He should be held to account. I myself will tell him. No, no, you mustn't, I cried. I couldn't bear to be the cause of any affront to Most, who is giving so much. Is he not entitled to a little joy? Backman persisted that I was too young in the movement, that I didn't know anything about revolutionary ethics or the meaning of revolutionary right and wrong. I admitted my ignorance, assured him I was willing to learn, to do anything, only not to have most hurt. He walked out without bidding me goodbye. I was greatly disturbed. The charm of Most was upon me. His remarkable gifts, his eagerness for life, for friendship, moved me deeply. And Berkman, too, appealed to me profoundly. His earnestness, his self-confidence, his youth, everything about him drew me with irresistible force. But I had the feeling that, of the two... Most was more of this earth. After that, Goldman and Most started dating more often, including a date at the Metropolitan Opera. And then came the anniversary of the Haymarket Massacre, so the whole group started organizing a large meeting to be held at Cooper Union. Goldman's job was to go to all different unions around the city and meet with them and try to get them to participate. She did such a good job that most suggested for the first time that she might consider being a public speaker. Goldman, Berkman, Fedya, and the Minkin sisters all pulled the resources to buy a large wreath for the occasion, and most gave one of the keynote speeches. Goldman thought most's speech was fantastic, but instead of going home with him at the end of the night, Berkman went home with her. The meeting was at an end. Sasha and I filed out with the rest. I could not speak. We walked on in silence. When we reached the house where I lived, my whole body began to shake, as in a fever. An overpowering yearning possessed me, an unutterable desire to give myself to Sasha, to find relief in his arms from the fearful tension of the evening. My narrow bed now held two human bodies, closely pressed together. My room was no longer dark. A soft, soothing light seemed to come from somewhere. As in a dream, I heard sweet, endearing words breathed into my ear, like the soft, beautiful Russian lullabies of my childhood. I became drowsy, my thoughts in confusion. I was roused from my drowsiness as if by an electric current. I felt a trembling, shy hand tenderly glide over me. Hungrily, I reached for it, for my lover. We were engulfed in a wild embrace. Again, I felt terrific pain, like the cut of a sharp knife. But it was numbed by my passion, breaking through all that had been suppressed unconscious and dormant. 
The morning still found me eagerly reaching out, hungrily seeking. My beloved lay at my side, asleep in blissful exhaustion. I sat up, my head resting on my hand. Long I watched the face of the boy who had so attracted and repelled me at the same time, who could be so hard and whose touch was yet so tender. Deep love for him welled up in my heart, a feeling of certainty that our lives were linked for all time. I pressed my lips to his thick hair. Then I, too, fell asleep. Sasha, of course, is the Russian nickname for Alexander, and what Goldman pretty much always called Berkman. Not too long after that, the group switches around living arrangements. Goldman and Helen Minkin go to move in with Berkman and Fedya. I'm not sure what happened to Anna Minkin, but she doesn't move in with them. Goldman and Fedya start going on long walks around the city together, talking about art. And Goldman likes Fedya so much, the two of them decide that Goldman will ask Berkman if he's interested in being in a three-person polyamorous relationship with them. The thing that happens next, though, is that Berkman gets Goldman alone one day, and Ashley tells her that as much as he likes her, she's always going to be secondary in his life because the revolution has to come first. She's so impressed by this that she actually drops the idea of Fedya altogether and decides just to stay with Berkman. Work-wise, most arrange is Goldman's first ever lecturing tour. She's going to go to Rochester, Buffalo, and Cleveland and talk about the value of an eight-hour workday. Most sees her off, and they wind up making out in a taxi on the way to Grand Central. The lectures go okay, but nothing amazing, and Goldman figures the reason they didn't do any better is because she let most tell her in advance what she ought to say, rather than her figuring it out for herself. She decides that from then on, she's going to write her own material. By the way, this whole idea of going out on lecturing tours, and the fact that Goldman and Berkman both later on run their own newspapers, isn't incidental. It's part of the heart of the whole anarchist movement. Here, Professor Goyens explains why. I can't stress it enough. It's, you know, for anyone who, and I think everyone should be interested in the history of the anarchist movement, because it's an absolutely fascinating movement across the globe. But anyone who wants to sort of delve into it, it's, it's so important to, to understand that I almost want to say the media landscape, you know, I know that's a modern contemporary word, but it's these two pillars, public speaking and periodicals. And here's the reason why, I mean, anyone could say, well, that's true for any movement. What, what's, so, what's so peculiar about the anarchists? The answer is that the anarchists never had a party and never wanted one. They never had a party structure. They never participated in elections, which means they never canvassed. They never had committees that that would further the, the, the votes. You know, all of that infrastructure, which is one difference with the socialist movement. That's how they how the movement moves, right? The anarchists didn't have any of this. They only had speeches and periodicals. Most goes out on his own two-week lecture tour, and Goldman goes with him. At the same time, though, she comes back to the idea of having this polyamorous relationship with Fedya and Berkman. This time, she doesn't drop it, and she asks Berkman about it. He agrees to go along with it, but in his own typical style, it's not because he says he's actually into the idea, but because he says it's consistent with his revolutionary principles, which don't allow him to be possessive or jealous. You might get the vibe here that I'm kind of calling bullshit on all of this. I'm not really, in the sense that I don't think Berkman was lying about his revolutionary principles. I just think that they sort of got mixed up with his own personal feelings sometimes, and he himself had a hard time separating them. Right about this time, Helen Minkin decides she's going to move out of the apartment and go live with Anna again, which I have to assume is probably because of the whole thruple thing going on. Most starts getting increasingly jealous. And Bergman decides that he could find a more receptive audience for his anarchism in Russia rather than in the United States. The thing is, he doesn't have the money to get there. Most, of course, is totally happy to help him raise money to get Berkman out of the picture. One night, Goldman and Most go for a walk, and he starts to come on to her, but she turns him down. My refusal made him angry, and he launched into a tirade against Sasha. Sasha. 
He had known long ago, he said, that I preferred that arrogant Russian Jew who had dared to hold him, most to account. To tell him what was in keeping with revolutionary ethics. He had ignored the criticism of the young fool who knew nothing of life. But he was tired of the whole thing, and that was why he was helping him go to Russia, far away from me. I would have to choose between him and Sasha. I, too, was a Russian Jew. Was he, Most, the anarchist, an anti-Semite? And how dare he say that he wanted me all to himself? Was I an object to be taken and owned? What kind of anarchism was that? Sasha had been right in claiming that Most was no longer an anarchist. Then things start unraveling pretty quickly for the group of friends. The romantic relationship between Goldman and Most starts to wind down, and she feels that he's being too controlling and too confining. Here's how Professor Goyens explains it. Going back to these sort of personal dynamics, I think when they all meet, let's say 1887, 88 or so, Most is, as far as I know, is, is not engaged, or not engaged, but is not involved with anyone. There's definitely feelings between Goldman and Most, but there were also feelings between Goldman and Berkman. Goldman herself writes about abuse that happened to her in her school days, I believe. Her father was quite abusive. Of course, the first marriage, which did not go well. She basically told uh, Jacob Kirshner, I think was his name, to say, look, I, I, got, I have to go. I can't, do, I can't be attached. So this, these are, this, this is the mindset of when they all meet. And so there is this opening, especially with Goldman, Berkman, probably Stein, to kind of um, explore and experiment. I think most is of an earlier generation he didn't like that too much. He, uh, you know, there is a, there, in a, I think in her memoir, she writes that most at some point asked Goldman to be more of a domestic partner for him. And just like her first husband, Kirshner, she tells most, no, I can't be that for you. I'm an activist now. I'm, I appreciate all you do for me, but I'm not doing that. I kind of feel most bad for Anna Minkin. For one thing, she's clearly on the B list as far as roommates go. And then she comes down with a case of consumption, also known as tuberculosis. It gets sent off to live at a sanitarium, also known as a tuberculosis hospital. And we never really hear about her again after that. All this time, most have been fighting a criminal conviction from years earlier. But that appeal finally gets to the end of its process. He loses and has to go spend a year in the prison out on Blackwell's Island. I tried to find a good description of what he was actually arrested for. The clearest description I can find came from a newspaper article in the Evening World on June 16th, 1891. And rather than summarize it, I figure I'll just read parts of it to you. It starts out by referring to most both as the apostle of anarchy and a warped-brained philosopher. It goes on to say that his conviction was for unlawful assembly, and it says... The, quote, unlawful assemblage in this case occurred at Kramer's Hall in 7th Street, near Avenue A, Saturday evening, November 12, 1887. It was a neighborhood of anarchists, and they were at the pitch of excitement over the execution of the Chicago anarchists. Aaron Most preached a funeral sermon in which he dilated on the heroism and courage of the, quote, martyrs, alluding to the police as, quote, bloodhounds, blue-collared ruffians, hirelings of the capitalists, etc., Most was arrested, tried, and convicted, and sentenced before Judge Cowing, who told Most that he had an overwhelming majority of the American people against him, and in America, the majority ruled. And that's how the article ends. What I get out of that is that Most was convicted and sent to jail for a year for calling the police blue-coated ruffians and hirelings of the capitalists, etc. Despite the conflict between them, Berkman is still working for Most, and they patch things up well enough so that Berkman goes with him when he has to turn himself in to go to jail. In the meanwhile, 
Fedya has moved up to Massachusetts to work at a photography studio, and he writes Goldman and tells her she should move up there with him, which she does, and Berkman comes not too long after that. They start their own business with this crazy plan where Fedya is going to take pictures, but Berkman is going to be the door-to-door salesman, going around from farm to farm up there, asking farmers if they'd like to come in and have their pictures taken. Not surprisingly, not many of them do. When that falls apart, they come up with another plan to open an ice cream parlor in Worcester. Part of the reason they're doing it is so that Berkman could keep raising money for his proposed trip to Russia. The shocking thing, though, is that the three of them turn out to be really good at selling ice cream. Here's how Goldman described it. Our savings consisted of $50. Our landlord, who had suggested the idea, said he would lend us $150. We secured a store, and within a couple of weeks, Sasha's skill with hammer and saw, Fedya's with his paint and brush, and my own good German housekeeping training succeeded in turning the neglected ramshackle place into an attractive lunchroom. It was spring, and not yet warm enough for an ice cream rush, but the coffee I brewed, our sandwiches and dainty dishes, were beginning to be appreciated, and soon we were kept busy till early morning hours. Within a short time, we had paid back our landlord's loan and were able to invest in a soda water fountain and some lovely colored dishes. We felt that we were on the way to the realization of our long-cherished dream. Things were going great, and maybe they could have kept selling ice cream forever, or at least until Sasha Berkman raised enough money to pay for his trip to Russia. But then they start reading something in the newspaper that gets under their skin. It's about the beginnings of a labor dispute at Carnegie Steel's plant at Homestead, Pennsylvania. Here's how journalist and professor Paul Krauss explains it. The labor dispute at Homestead in July 1892 began as a lockout. That is, Henry Clay Frick and Andrew Carnegie decided to close the mill and prevent unionized workers from uh, working there. So in truth, it was a lockout. It was a kind of public relations uh, victory on the part of Frick and Carnegie to sell their uh, provocative actions as a strike, as uh, to, to uh, encourage the larger public to see this as uh, an assault by a radical union uh, against uh, the legitimate corporate interests of Carnegie Steel. But the truth was it began as a lockout. Days, a few days after workers were prevented from entering the mill, uh, union leaders convened a huge meeting and uh, more than 3,000 uh, steel workers voted uh, to go on strike, that is to withhold uh, formally their labor uh, from Carnegie and Frick and from management. But it began, it began as a lockout, it wasn't a strike. This bothers Goldman and Berkman so much that Berkman forgets about the idea to go to Russia, and the two of them decide to get personally involved on behalf of the locked-out strikers. More on that in the next episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and to tell your friends. Check out acrossfromjericho.com for all sorts of good stuff like pictures, transcripts, show notes, and links to all of our socials. Across from Jericho is a Split River Media production, researched and narrated by me, Jeff Grossman. This episode starred Spencer Fox as Soltaroff, Sarah Natacheni as Emma Goldman, and Roy North as Alexander Berkman. Audio mixing and sound design by Scott Rosenthal. Logo and graphics by Mark Richard Smith. The website was designed by Alec Farrell, and the theme music is Yo Cool by Alexander Nakarada. Special thanks to Brad Jarman, Teresa Buchheister, the Emma Goldman Papers Public History Project, Karen J. Greenberg, and Ethan Nickturn. Dedicated to the memory of my dad, Richard Grossman. Copyright 2023 by Split River Media, LLC.